All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. And it is Tuesday, and you know what that means. Time to dive deeper into the wisdom of the Tao and Dr. David R. Hawkins and classical teachings on spiritual truth and enlightenment. And really seeking to discover more about this term or this idea, this concept of enlightenment, so that we can begin to apply and use it in and to our lives and so that we can increase the quality of our lives and not only our lives but the lives of those around us because our life is made up of moments and sometimes we forget that and if we fill up our moments with low quality experience Maybe sometimes by our thought processes or our focuses of thinking in non-positive directions. And, you know, we can end up filling our entire lives with this negative kind of experience. Sometimes it's out of our control, but if we can increase our awareness and our understanding of ourselves and our minds and spirituality and the nature of reality then we can begin to create an ability to respond, a responsibility so that we can in turn increase the quality of our lives moment by moment, whether it is by choice or us being able to deal with something that is thrown at us in life through a new awareness. And so we will be diving, like I said, into the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins, like we have been on this series, and we'll be continuing in the bonus material of valuable qualities for a spiritual seeker. And we've gone through not comparing yourself with others regarding holiness, merit, goodness, sinlessness, or deservingness. We've also gone through talking about accepting the concept of the fear is God is the wrong way to think about God. God is actually peace and love and all-encompassing, and we are a part of that. And, that. and someone I also liked made a comment last week about making the distinction between feeling yourself as a God rather than being of God or a part of God. Everything is God. It's not just, you're like, oh, now I have this, and I'm God. No, it's like, even... The table is God, too, and you are no greater than the table. But that doesn't make either one lesser, because it is all a oneness. Now, that's deep, though, and we've talked about that a lot before on this channel anyways. And then realizing this depiction of God as a judge or, you know, a parent, somebody like this. I like to describe it because it's funny as a Santa figure judging who's naughty and nice and you're going to get coal and, you know, this kind of concept. It says, when God becomes, what God becomes in most people's minds is a parent who rewards you and loves you if you're good and punishes you if you're bad. That's nothing but a parent. Realize that God is something greater than just this concept. And the concepts of good and bad are silly human notions. And so... It continued on to avoiding negatively uh, calibrated levels of consciousness, which are, you know, negative feelings and emotions, and following the goal to reach unconditional love. And so, then we went through realizing the difference between salvation and enlightenment, and that they are different goals. I'll read that one real quick. Salvation is concerned with yes or no. Enlightenment is concerned with becoming something beyond that which you have already been. So becoming something greater. Self-improvement. And so, you know, even if you're not a spiritual person, self-development, self-improvement isn't for people that are messed up. It is for all of us so that we can keep going and keep growing. Mm, hope you're comfy, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you got yourself a beverage of your choice, hot or cold. Went with the tea again today. It's been a while since I've done some tea. Mm, so tasty. And what does the tea say today? Because we used to do that often. It says compassion 
is the constant act of giving oneself to others. So give your gifts. Don't leave with your gifts still inside you, was the great quote. Now, we come to... I'll finish that little bit about salvation there. Salvation requires purification of the ego. Enlightenment is concerned with letting it go and eliminating the ego. The goal of enlightenment is somewhat more demanding than simply being a good person. Enlightenment is something other than good personhood. It's advancing one's level of consciousness in the nonlinear realms, as David Hawkins puts it. And so now we come to this piece of a valuable quality for a spiritual seeker. And he says, comfort replaces insecurity for those of us on this path. When one realizes, so when we begin to realize that the most important goal has already been achieved. And it's like, what do you mean? You know, if we're seeking after this lofty concept of enlightenment or a new awareness to where we can experience life with more of a bliss and a joy and a flowing type of nature, then we must realize that when we're on this path, we have already accomplished the most important goal, which is to be on the path. <laughs> it's funny, but it is true and it is most important to realize and pat yourself on the back that if you are here and we are here, then we are some of the few that are on the path. I think many, many more nowadays are beginning to get on the quote-unquote path, whatever that means. I mean, some people don't like that term. Whatever you want to call it, your own personal spiritual development journey through your life. But comfort replaces insecurity when one realizes that the most important goal has already been accomplished. The goal is to be on the path. Next, spiritual love. Spiritual development is not an accomplishment. So this right there fixes the confusion because so many people getting into spirituality, spiritual philosophy, and, you know, seeking after enlightenment, wanting to become an enlightened person. And I'm not against creating a world of enlightened men and women would be a beautiful place and maybe we've been there before in the previous golden age and we're heading back that direction and i like to think that things are getting better than they've been faster than we can possibly imagine even the most optimistic of us however a lot of people get in this trap of okay i'm gonna do these spiritual acts and this will be me accomplishing these spiritual goals like a reward system, and I'll be building points towards enlightenment. This is the same concept of going back to where God is a judge. And, you know, this idea of fearing God, building your points so that you can hopefully get to heaven, enlightenment. Whatever that be, that's not the correct way to think of it. So, knowing that the goal is to be on the path, then spiritual love, spiritual development is not a reward or an accomplishment, but it is simply a way of life. Now, if you're wondering, I'm paraphrasing from the book and then going back and forth between whatever pops into my head and what I'm thinking at the same time I'm reading that, and then I try to articulate both of those things together at the same time to you. But remember, we are reading from the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins for purposes of teaching and commentary and expanding the mind so that we can increase our awareness and hopefully increase the quality of our lives. Now, knowing that this idea of doing 500 days straight of meditating, which couldn't be a bad thing, however, it is not something that's going to get you spiritual points so that you can win. It's not the way to look at it. 
Spiritual development is not an accomplishment, but it is a way of life. It is a discipline, a lifestyle. And the reward itself is in the process. Not by, you know, stacking up a bunch of points. I'll read what the book says now. Quote, it is an orientation that brings its own rewards. And what is important is the direction of one's own motives in life. There's no value in keeping the scorecard on yourself, the scorecard marking, how far have I come? Or how far do other people think that I have come? Which can be even more a blocking to this alignment process that we've described before. The only one you have to answer to is yourself. And you really don't have any expectations that you need to live up to. I mean, sometimes that's what gives us so much pressure is we're like, I need to be greater, and, you know, fulfill the some sort of weird standards that your ego subconsciously creates for yourself to put you under some kind of weird pressure. Whether that be in any area of your life, not just related to you know, a spiritual pursuit. But the only one you have to answer to is yourself. And it's, you know, I would even like to say that enjoy it. This is supposed to be fun. Like, remember, the purpose of life coming to us from Hermes or Thoth, the Egyptian sage god from the Hermetic teachings, is that the purpose of life is to see that everything is creation and quote-unquote God or Atum whatever God is to you, but everything is that, and you are a part of that, and then to love it and appreciate it and see the beauty in it, which is a challenge for us here in this realm of duality. And so once we can do that, then we tend to it, and that is it. That's simple, a very simple uh, life purpose or direction. But anyways... I apologize for my rambling, but it's why I'm here, I guess. I enjoy doing this. I'd be reading this by myself anyways. And so I really appreciate all of you that spend time here with me on these videos as well in the premieres and the live chat. So we don't have to answer to any kind of great expectation. The motivation, the book continues, to seek God, the Tao, the universe, understanding the things that are, as Hermes put it. This motivation to seek God is God. Because if we see this could be kind of deep, like, whoa, what do you mean by that, Chase? The motivation to seek God is God. Well, it's like if we are a part of that, which is everything, then our motivation to seek that which we are already a part of, which is kind of a contradictory thing to begin with. This is where a lot of Zen philosophies go. But that is itself, if that makes sense, because we are a part of it, seeking it. So that is it. What does that mean, though, or how does that apply to what we're talking about here, Dr. David Hawkins? He says, nobody actually seeks God except under the influence of divinity. Because man left to his own device will never think of it. Very fascinating. Next, valuable quality for a spiritual seeker. Appreciate that every step forward brings benefits to everyone. Appreciate that every step forward brings benefits to everyone. So as you advance, you or me or anybody, ladies and gentlemen, advances spiritually, it brings a value to everyone, to every human being. He says, because of the collective consciousness that we share, every single person who improves helps to elevate the level 
of consciousness. Not just, that's why I say, not just for ourselves and our own lives, but for everyone and the lives of those around us. But before we dive into explaining the rest of that valuable quality for a spiritual seeker, it is Tuesday, and you know what that means. On Tuesdays, we do the Tao now, reading from Dr. Wayne W. Dyer's Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao. And we did this entire book on this channel in a previous series. So check that out if you want to go through the 81 verses of the Tao Te Ching and my ramblings. But it's been over a year since I've done that, and so I thought we'd go back like we have on the last few weeks on Tuesdays, and choose a random verse and just touch on it briefly and see how it applies to everything we've been learning so far. Let's go right there. Boom. Living as if your life makes a difference. It is the 54th verse of the Tao Te Ching. And by Lao Tzu, if you don't know, over 2,500 years ago. And so, coming from the sage Lao Tzu, from 2,500 years ago, here is the 54th verse of the Tao Te Ching on living as if your life makes a difference. Begins by saying, quote, Whoever is planted in the Tao, will not be rooted up. Whoever embraces the Tao will not slip away. Generations honor generations endlessly, cultivated in the self. Virtue is realized. Cultivated in the family, virtue overflows. Cultivated in the community, virtue increases. Cultivated in the state, Virtue abounds. The Tao is everywhere. It has become everything. To truly see it, see it as it is. In a person, see it as a person. In a family, see it as a family. And in a country, see it as a country. In the world, see it as the world. How do I know? This is true by looking inside myself, by looking inside oneself, ladies and gentlemen. And that concludes the 54th verse of the Tao Te Ching. That is very fascinating. He describes finding the Tao in everything and everywhere, in people and families and countries and in the world. And how can you know that? By finding it, by looking inside and doing the own, your own inner work. And this spiritual path that we are talking about in the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins. And especially the valuable qualities for a spiritual seeker. What does Wayne Dyer have to say about this 54th verse of the Tao Te Ching? He says... In this verse of the Tao, you're invited to see your role in the transformation of the planet, or as we were just getting at, the elevation of the level of consciousness of all of humanity. And so, instead of perceiving ourselves, Wayne continues, as one insignificant individual among billions of people, we are urged to see ourselves as the Tao itself. See, this is so funny. These always connect perfectly. I was just describing how we are connected to it all. It is not, you know, that's so hilarious. And so you need to see yourself as God itself or as a part of God. Not like you're a separate God and you're going to go fly around and do super things. <laughs> it's not the concept. So if you're taking it that way, think twice because you are urged to see yourself as this force, as a part of the Tao itself. We are the world, quote unquote, is everybody's theme song. You do make a difference, Wayne Dyer says. And when you live with this joyful awareness that you potentially have an infinite impact, not only on the world or humanity, but on the universe, 
that's a different study about frequencies and which is wonderful. It really adds to this feeling as David Hawkins put it a minute ago, it really removes the feeling of insecurity or discomfort when one realizes that you're the, the main goal has already been accomplished, which is you are a part of God already. And that the, you know, the only goal is to be on the path. And if you are on the path, then you've already achieved it. And so all that is to be done is to continue and to grow. And so, with that being said, when you can live with this joyful awareness that we potentially have an infinite impact on the universe, Wayne Dyer says, we'll radiate this Tao consciousness, this higher level of consciousness that Dr. David Hawkins describes. And you'll be like a wave of energy, Wayne Dyer says, that illuminates a room. Everyone will see the light and become affected. And I'll add there, just on a realistic note, like how many times have you seen somebody come into, you know, whether it be uh, a public area or, you know, uh, into a room or into any kind of space, and you can literally feel their joy or their angst, their anxiety, their struggle, Maybe this is just an empath kind of thing. But I mean, when people, I think it's an everybody kind of thing. Some people just focus on it more or less. But, you know, you can really sense when people are angry and upset. And you can really sense when people are like light and lifted. And anyways, everyone will see the light and become affected. And it becomes contagious. It does. When you're around four you know, upset, Wayne likes to say, cantankerous people. <laughs> it can really, it rubs off on you. And so you need to watch the kind of people that you spend time around. Everybody would say, cut negative people out of your life, but, you know, family members or loved ones and things like this our, you know, our soul grouping that we go through this journey of life traveling with that we don't have to totally cut them out, but you can limit, you know, your the amount of negativity that you allow and surround yourself with more positivity. This is great when it becomes, you know, when it comes to curating the kind of content that you take in, including movies and all kinds of things. But with that being said, I'm tangenting again, and I apologize. <laughs> Hope you're getting value. If you are, consider subscribing, smash the like, and share this with somebody who is like-minded. Support the work that we do. We will. Those who are unaware of this Tao nature will begin to notice the difference. And those who were aware, but not living as if their lives mattered, will be attracted and begin changing. So recognize your life as a part of the great way, as a part of God, as a part of the Tao, as a part of creation. And then love, begin to love that and appreciate it. And if, you know, that seems difficult, what we have to do in the beginning is change our perspective and the way that we see things. Because when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at, change and when you change your thoughts you change your life i love this book i will have it linked in the comments below so you can get it for yourself to put it on your shelf wayne dyer reviewed hundreds of translations of the Tao Te Ching, and he's written 81 distinct essays on how to apply the ancient wisdom of lao tzu from 2500 years ago to our modern world today ladies and gentlemen and so he seeks, he's advising us to see our divinity and to know that, to know that we make a difference. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, so let us continue on those valuable qualities for a spiritual seeker in the bonus material of the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins. And it connects so well there to this point that we were on appreciating 
that every step forward brings benefits to everyone. So as you advance spiritually, it brings value to everyone, to every human being. See, I'm contemplating this as I go, and hopefully you are. And that's why I'll pause every now and then. Because remember, as Hermes or Thoth said in the very beginning of his Hermetic teachings, was that pure philosophy is spiritual striving through a constant contemplation to attain true knowledge of what he called Atum, the one God, what I like to call the nature of reality, the universe, and God. We're trying to answer the ultimate questions here, so if you think we're far out, then you're right on with that. <laughs> ah, good tea. So, how do we do this? Because of this collective consciousness, the book continues, every single person who improves helps to elevate the level of consciousness of the rest of those. And that, as that elevates, the incidence of the more um, the more prone behaviors and uh, expressions of the lower level of consciousness that we have as far as the incidence of war, suffering, ignorance, savaging, and disease, and so many of these things diminish. When you advance yourself, you are helping everybody appreciate that every step forward benefits everyone. One's spiritual dedication and work is a gift to life. A gift to life and the love of your fellow human beings, of mankind. He says, it's nice to know that what you think you're doing only for yourself <laughs> is actually benefiting everyone around you. To be kind to just one living being benefits everyone, ladies and gentlemen. To be kind to just one living being benefits everyone. And we have to begin with knowing that we matter and to begin being kind to ourselves because we are just important as anyone else or anything else. And we are all part of this together. And so to harm yourself or any other human being is harming the generic human being, which we are all. This is the way that I like to think of it. And this, to me, is a good quality philosophy. And so if you disagree, that's perfectly fine. I mean, everybody's got their own ways to think about things, but we're trying to improve the quality of our lives. If we can increase our understanding and our awareness, then hopefully we can increase the quality of our experience. Now let us go into the next valuable quality for a spiritual seeker. There is no timetable or prescribed route to God. There is no timetable of enlightenment, and there's no prescribed path for any one individual. It's funny to see people going to seek out the same path of how, you know, another one did it, whether it be the Buddha or great gurus or just individuals that they know personally that have had mystical or, you know, enlightenment, quote unquote, type experiences. And they'll want to try to pursue the same route. Let's go do these, uh, you know, sensory deprivation experiences or, you know, all kinds of different things. The, the medicine, plant medicine journeys. And, you know, everybody has their own path. And so that's not to say that any one of these tools are not correct for one's path. But hopefully you can determine that through your discernment because i think discernment when on this kind of path in life 
seeking to find God or discover. Anyways, you know what I'm saying. Let us continue. I'm rambling too much again, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you got what I was getting at. There is no timetable or prescribed route to God. Although each person's route is unique, the terrain to be covered is relatively common to all. Whatever torments you and whatever torments that you go through in trying to perfect yourself, overcoming quote-unquote sinfulness, which is not, remember we talked about that, not what the Christian concept of that has taught us. It is more, uh, it's an, actually an archery term, I believe, in the Greek translations that means a missing of the mark. And so when you think of this, when you're shooting archery and you miss the mark, you're not like, damn, forever. You're not, you're, you know, it's like the C syndrome when people don't want to try stuff, new things. They shoot one basket and go, see, I can never do it again. I'm terrible. It's like the only way you get good at something is by practicing. So this idea of missing the mark to me means more of like, okay, you missed the mark this time, but work to get better. Like seriously, actually take it seriously in your life to work to not continue missing the mark every time that you are living your life related to this concept of sin. And realize, it says, whatever torments you go through in trying to perfect yourself, overcoming this idea of missing the mark and selfishness, etc., realize that this is common to all of mankind in this experience of duality of the physical realm and so people troop into church sunday mornings everybody working on the same problem how to be less selfish and how to be more giving and more loving etc again the work this is the next quality the work is to surmount and transcend the common human failings that are inherent in the structure of our ego or our subconscious survival programming. And so whatever defects the book continues, you have are, they're not just personal, okay? It's not your fault. This is like what we have been programmed with through our evolutionary biology so that we can survive. But when we are now, very rapidly in a new state of living and environment with a lot more safety than trying to survive in the wild in groups of, you know, people in camps and whatever that may be. We now experience the same kind of, you know, I, the way I describe this is there are no tigers. And it's my favorite metaphor. It's like, what do you mean? Like, talking about all this and now you tell me there's no tigers like <laughs> we have this survival instinct that like if if we were in the grocery store and a tiger were to walk in the grocery store we have these survival instincts that kick in automatically that we would somehow find a, a way to climb up into the rafters <laughs> joking but you know what i mean like you have built in feelings fear, anxiety, that are responses automatically to certain impulses emotionally to stimuli that come to you from life. And so we've, our, our style of living has evolved so fast that we still, you know, we get stressed out about the bills and we're feeling like there's tigers, like in the room behind us. And we're living with this stress and this anxiety. And so we have to begin to remember that it's not your fault, first of all, that you are feeling these things because it is inherently programmed into us to think that there are tigers. But we need to remember that there are no tigers. And we are perfectly comfortable and you are safe. I mean, if you're not, then you'll know that that's the case. But I mean... For the most part, nowadays in modern society, it's like. And so what we need to do is we need to begin the work 
the personal work. And the work is to surmount, get over, and transcend, go beyond the common human failings that are inherent in this structure of the human ego. So the book continues, whatever defects you have, they're not just personal, they're not just yours. They are the problem of that survival programming, the human ego itself. And the problem is one of evolution, that mankind at this point has evolved only to a certain point. One would like to think that they are personal problems, you know, my stress and my anxiety. And I'm not saying that some of us don't have those. But on the general, you know, bell curve, is what we're talking about, we're not talking about specific cases, on the average one would like to think that they're personal. However, the ego itself is not personal. And so people would like to think, oh, me and my progress. Or, oh, me and my, you know, terrible sins. Or me and my difficulties. And what you're talking about is not your personal self. The problem is that of the ego itself. And so, you stop taking the blame. You stop taking this ego personally. And when we realize, I mean, this is really deep, but if you can get this bit right here, and if you're even picking up on some of this little bit right here, about and what you're talking about is not your personal self when you're saying, oh, me and my progress, or oh, me and my, you know, difficulties. It is not your personal self. The problem is that of the ego itself, which is the part of us. You know, when we like say to ourselves, when we say anything to ourselves, who are we talking to? There's two people there. And so that's a crazy thing to discover. But when you do realize it, then you can start playing the game a little bit differently. And you don't start taking your negative self-talk personally. And you actually can start combating it. This is really powerful. And so when you stop taking the ego personally, when we realize that it's really a collective problem that we share with all of mankind that makes us feel a little less guilty. It alleviates that ultimate responsibility feeling that like, you know, I'm not good enough. And that's so funny that this started with appreciating that you are good enough. And that you have already accomplished the goal. And you are on the path. And that is the goal. And so. This has been beautiful. This has been a very good one, ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed it. And I know that you have. And so let's finish up with this last little bit here. Of trying to surmount and transcend the common human failings that are inherent in the structure of our ego. In. When we realize it is collectively a problem that we all share, it makes us feel a little less guilty. It's not the personal I. It's the human ego. It's our evolutionary biology program, which comes out of the structure of the brain itself, plus the human experience of life on this planet. And so we want to surmount and transcend the common human failings that are inherent in the structure of that, the human ego, the, you know, the evolutionary experience that has led us to now and why we feel the way we do when it doesn't match up with the situations that we're in. And so the human ego, not your ego, but the human ego. So you say. Well, that is characteristic of the human ego. <laughs> he ends with a little joke there. The ego, this is the next quality, and we'll finish here. The ego was inherited along with becoming a human being. See, the hermetics, and we'll be talking about more of the hermetics tomorrow and diving deeper into the corpus hermeticum and the teachings of the ancient Egyptian mystical philosophy and spiritual ideas and understandings but 
it's like that the <clears throat> I'll wait I'll wait there. The ego was inherited along with becoming a human being. So when we come from the spiritual realm into the material realm, we inherit inherit cert in inherent qualities. <laughs> Sorry. But we get certain qualities that are aspects, traits, or characteristics of being mortal in the physical realm of duality as compared to the spiritual immortal realm of oneness or non-duality. And so, I mean, if you're trying to get me to prove any of this, this just seems to be like, if you're wondering, why do you think this is all real? You know, it doesn't just seem like a bunch of hocus pocus to you sometimes or mumbo, Joe, you know. It's like, it seems to me that every spiritual tradition, almost all around the entire planet, throughout all of the ages, has been referencing one thing. They call it a bunch of different names, usually God or, you know, something like that, but to understand and to really get the deeper connection and sense of what all of us for all of time have been trying to figure out and discover and describe that seems to be the most important influence in all of reality, especially when it comes to the quality of experience, is this thing that we are trying to discover here. And so, hopefully that answers your question of why am I even looking into this? Because this is referenced by every culture and every spiritual tradition from the highest to the lowest levels from, you know, time immemorial. <laughs> so, it seems to be that they were at least, this seems to be the most credible source, is all sources that seem to be referencing that similar thing. And then by cross-referencing, hopefully, we can come to discover the true knowledge of, as Hermes or Thoth describes it, Atum, the one God, or the universe or reality or God, simply. And so with that being said, being said, back to the ego, the ego was inherited along with becoming a human being. The ego is a product of the brain and the function of the brain. And details differ based on past karma of how this expresses itself. Wow. That's a very, very complex sentence there. The details differ based on past karma and how the function of the brain and the ego expresses itself. The ego is one thing. The brain function is another thing. And then you add it to past karma. Now, karma is not that well known in the Western world. And if you do know a lot about karma, then you are unique. Because I've been researching spiritual stuff for, you know, about 10 years now. And I really have only read like one book on karma, which was called Karma Rules that I got from my brother. Shout out to my brother. And it was a good one. It was a simple overview, but I don't feel like I got, you know, any kind of mystical understanding of the laws of karma and how that all works and then there's dharma and that's a different thing but anyways but once you grab on to karma you'll find that it's a very handy tool and that is where dr david hawkins finishes up and we've got one two three and they're really big ones. One, two, three for next week. And we will go into more Dao as well. Learning from Dr. Wayne W. Dyer and Lao Tzu. And we'll be looking at next Tuesday, intense prayer augments dedication and inspiration and facilitates progress. But I would be careful with what prayer means to you because there's important distinctions to be made there as well, just like we talked about the term sin earlier today. Remember, the translations have been made to keep us confused, keep us in the dark, and keep us from becoming enlightened men and women. So we need to do our due diligence and use our discernment 
and begin to become self-educated. And so that we can unindoctrinate ourselves, become our own guide, our own guru, and our own master. That we can master our own ascension. Shout out to Jeff for those quotes. Those are good ones. I haven't thought of that in a while. But also, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be looking at the grace of God is available to everyone. The grace of this force that we are all a part of. And the strength of the ego can be overcome, but it can be quite formidable. That should be exciting. Fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. I probably should have put a bookmark there, but it's at the very back anyways. We can find it easy. And we will be looking forward to doing that next Tuesday. I want to thank you so much. I love and appreciate all of you that spend time here with me and David Hawkins and Lao Tzu and Wayne Dyer and all the wonderful authors and spirits and poets. I was going to say spiritual, but I just call them spirits. Wonderful authors and, yeah, to all the deceased <laughs> authors and poets and mystics. Thank you so much. Be sure to expand the description to get both of these books for yourself so that you, ladies and gentlemen, can put it on your shelf. And so that you can follow along in the continuing of the series, because we might actually read through that whole book, not just the bonus features at the end, as well as Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Tao, which I highly re-recommend, easy for me to say, because it's great to reference for yourself anytime. And they're really simple, like two-page little essays on how we can apply this great wisdom from this sage from 2,500 years ago into our lives today. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Once again, love it. Appreciate each and every one of you. Expand the description below. Check out my Etsy shop, Landscape Paintings, a link to C60 Purple Power, the most powerful antioxidant known to man. Give yourself the gift of health and also a link to the books so you can get them. And it was funny. I'll address a couple of comments. There was one guy that said, and I've been waiting for this comment, so thank you for it. One guy said, why do you have a globe in your background? Don't you know that we live on a flat plane? <laughs> and I love that one because, you know, I'm very open. I've listened to a lot of the different flat earth, you know, David Weiss or whoever, all these different guys that go on the bigger shows and do interviews and, you know, podcasts about this stuff. And I just love listening to all the theories that exist. Like I've gone down the Tartaria rabbit holes and space doesn't even exist rabbit holes and inner earth, which is a very fun one and Agartha and, you know, all of those different ideas. The, the fact that uh, Antarctica is actually an ice wall and that, we are only a little circle within the known realm and there's these different, you know, little extra terra, so to speak. And the extraterrestrials come from beyond the ice wall from the extra terra. And there's so, you know, so there's so many theories. I mean, even as far out as the Wild West never happened. And all of them explained and, you know, uh, explain enthusiastically and you know charismatically can be very compelling theories and fun to think about and so i do hold the belief and firm you know i stand firm behind the notion that to hold two opposing ideas simultaneously and not canceling out either one of them earth is exactly what we've been told from you know science and all of that in the system or that it's exactly not. And to hold those both at the same time and you're open to them and both of them could possibly be real. For me, that's how I like to think of it. And I'll have to bring up that quote one time. If you can think of that quote, to hold two opposing ideas at the same time is extremely valuable. It's extremely valuable. So don't, you know, shut everything out. But so in answer to why do I have a globe in the background? It's just a nice lamp. I like the light that it puts off. And I got it from a family member. So I like it. You know, it's a memento. And then it makes me question, hmm, are we really where we think we are? 
I kind of like the idea that it's a toroid feel, a, you know, the shape of a toroidal field or a magnetic field to where it looks like a ball, but there's ice caps covering the top and the bottom, and it actually goes in, and it has a magnetic field shape. But, you know, even that's far out there for some people, and you'd have to watch a two-hour podcast about why that's the case. <laughs> and I'm not here to convince anybody. We're here to look after spiritual philosophy. And the last comment I wanted to address was somebody asked, why do you wear red? Because <laughs> I'm always wearing the red polo shirts. And my answer was, I don't know, they're comfy shirts. I have blue ones. And so here's a blue shirt for you. <laughs> that was just hilarious. But love and appreciate each one, each and every one of you. Remember, seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of reality and seek to discover the hidden mysteries of our history and our past. And also remember that there is no way to happiness. There's no way to enlightenment because it is the way. It is the activity, the process that we must bring to life. And when we can do that, when we can bring happiness to life, then all the things we've been telling ourselves, oh, I'll be happy or I'll be enlightened or when I get this or when I'm that kind of person or have this much money, all of that becomes irrelevant because then we are there. And hopefully the entire journey is wonderful. All right. Love and appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much once again. And I will catch you tomorrow on Wednesday Wisdom, diving deeper into the lost wisdom of the Hermetics in the Corpus Hermeticum. Hermes Thoth, Trismegistus. All right. No, 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 no. Be the change you want to see. Be the example you want to set.